I'm delighted to be joined by the living embodiment of the British Civil Service, <laughs> Gus O'Donnell, Lord O'Donnell. Very nice Good to morning. see you, Gus. Um, so I did want to start with what has been mm. one of the most sustained attacks on the integrity of the civil service that I certainly I can mm -hmm. remember by serving ministers, by members of the ruling party. Mm -hmm. Jacob Rees-Mogg, a very influential man within the Tory party, says that the government's economists have effectively distorted their analysis because they've got a particular view of the Brexit they want. What do you, what do you make of that? I think that's completely crazy. I mean, the, the truth is, civil servants operate by the civil service code. Mm. The values are honesty, objectivity, integrity, impartiality. Mm. Their job is to look at the evidence yeah and present it as best they can and, you know, an analyse the uncertainties because none of these things are, you know, it's, it's hard to forecast anything and, of course, you know, you won't get it right all the time, but that's what they do. They're objective and impartial. And I think what you find is that tends to get accepted very nicely when it agrees with someone's prior beliefs, but yeah. actually when someone doesn't like the answer, quite often they decide to shoot the messenger. Uh, one of the things I was slightly surprised by was, you know, on her trip to China, she tried to play down the significance of these forecasts, which say that broadly on every version of a trade deal that the rest of the EU thinks we're going to get, the British economy will be smaller, the British people will be poorer. She said, well, I hadn't signed off this particular analysis, as though somehow, you know, that kind of work is something that ministers sign off. But they don't, do they? Well, uh, no, that's an input into ministerial decisions. Yeah. So it's trying to be an objective analysis. Yeah. This is where I think people get it wrong. So, for example, when people talk about the Treasury forecast, yeah. I mean, in the old days, in my day, yeah. the officials would present a forecast to a Chancellor who could then cross out, I remember one, crossing out the number for growth and putting in a higher number and crossing out the number for inflation and putting in a lower number. Yeah. And that's why it was a fantastic thing that the Office of Budget and Responsibility was set up, so this is done independently of ministers. It was essentially to stop politicians, ministers, distorting the numbers. Exactly. And, and it's been very and successful. And it's not, because one of the charges made against these you know, government economists, not all of whom, let's be clear, it's, been, it's the Treasury that's been attacked for this, but actually these economists yeah. are from a whole range of departments, yeah. the government's economic service. Exactly. Just to be clear, one of the attacks on them is that they're plainly biased and that's why the Office of Budget Responsibility was set up. I mean, you know, the truth is that it was set up because people didn't trust politicians, not because they didn't trust civil servants. Exactly right. I mean, if you take a civil servant and you were to cut them in half, and let's be honest, there's a lot of people, <laughs> MPs out there who would love to do this, you would get it's like a stick of rock, you'd see the honesty, objectivity, integrity and partiality. That's the point, you know, we look at the evidence and we go where it is. Now, of course, if you're selling snake oil, you don't like the idea of experts and testing your product. And I think that's what we've got. This backlash against evidence and experts is because they know where the experts will go. I mean, Lord Turnbull, uh, who's actually your immediate predecessor, I think, mm -hmm. as head of the Civil Service and Cabinet Secretary, has said today in The Observer that he sees this attack on the Civil Service as somewhat redolent of what the Nazis did in the 1930s. <laughs> well, it's funny, isn't it, that sometimes you get these attacks uh, because they just don't like the message. I think that's what it is. I mean, I, I, if you look back, Treasury economists on the euro said, we think actually joining the euro is a really bad idea. They yep. did lots of analysis like that. We didn't hear people then stopping up saying, well, you know, that's terrible. They're, they're biased. Actually, they were just telling the evidence as it is. And I think history has borne, borne out that that was a very accurate prediction. And just to be clear, what you're not arguing is, of course, that these numbers are telling the 100% factual truth of what is going to happen. You're just saying they're being made in good faith and therefore they should be treated by ministers in Pre good faith. Precisely. These things are based on models. They're, they're subject to uncertainties. I mean, it reminds me of when... President Johnson, yeah. was, it was alleged that he, he asked, you know, what's the impact on revenue of this tax change? And the officials came back and said, well, there's quite a wide range in all of this. And he said, ranges are for cattle, give me a number. And that's part of the problem, really, that people are looking for certainty. 
What these models tell us and what people should come away from it, I haven't seen this paper, is that basically on balance it looks like all of these options leave us to some degree worse off than we, than we would be if we weren't leaving Brexit, um, the EU. So, we haven't got a lot of time. A couple of other questions. Mm. In your role, the role that you used to have, mm -hmm. you're there to support the government, mm -hmm. but you've also got to look at what's in the national interest. Yeah. How challenging is that for your successor, Jeremy Haywood? Because there will be times... Brexit... I mean, the point is, Brexit is forever, mm -hmm. you know, and a government is only there till the next election. How difficult is it to, for him to decide, do I back Theresa May or do I back my judgement and the judgement of my officials about what's in the national interest essentially for the next, you know, 50 years? It's not difficult. And the reason is, it's in the terms, civil servant, right? right? We are there to present the analysis and the evidence in as objective and honest a way as we can. Right. In the end, the democratically elected ministers will make their decisions. Right. It is then the civil service's job to get on and implement them and get us the best deal implement, possible. Implement, yes, but the advice should be what he believes is in the national interest. Is Precisely, that right? Precisely, yes. OK. And and it thing... makes it a lot yeah. easier if you have a cabinet that kind of then makes that decision based on that advice. Yeah. When you've got them all arguing different positions, particularly when you're in a negotiation with third parties, that weakens our case yeah. and only plays into the hands of people like Monsieur Barnier. Now, there does seem to be a really deep split, certainly between the Chancellor Philip Hammond and a number of members of the cabinet, but probably between Philip Hammond and the Prime Minister on the nature of the trade deal that we should have. Has there been a split as deep and as important as this since the Lawson-Thatcher split over whether we should shadow the Deutsche Mark? Well, let's... let's uh, I mentioned the case of the Euro. You know, yeah. at the time, the, I think the Prime Minister and some other members of his Cabinet were deeply in favour. This, you know, going back to 1997, yeah. were in favour of us joining the Euro. The Chancellor at the time, Gordon Brown, wasn't. Mm and asked the Treasury to do some objective analytical work, yeah. which they did. And that came up with an answer saying, actually, for us, it would be a bad idea. But, but can I just ask you, if, on the basis of, you know, your knowledge of history, mm -hmm. can a Chancellor and a Prime Minister both stay in office when the divide is as deep as it seems to be? I think if they fail to come to a conclusion... Mm. Then, then I think things get incredibly serious. I think yeah. what they're working on now, and what I hope this paper's trying to do, yeah. is to give them all the evidence on which they can come to a single policy, mm. which we can then take into those negotiations and come up with the best deal for Britain. And, and then finally, Ollie Robbins, the particular uh, official who's got mm. lead responsibility on the Brexit talks. Mm -hmm. Again, he's being accused of being biased, pursuing his own agenda. I mean, this is completely ridiculous. What Ollie wants is a clear steer, some leadership from the Prime Minister and the Cabinet to say, here's what you want you to argue for, here's what we want. And he's palpably not getting it at the moment, is he? Well, uh, they're taking a little bit of time. I mean, I, these are complex issues, so... But they must soon. Uh, come to a decision, and I think that's what I would urge. And if they don't? If they don't, well, you know, it'll be like you and I negotiating when you're very clear what you want and I haven't got a clue. I mean, you're going to win. Gus O'Donnell. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I think we're always going to win in that conversation, aren't we, Gus? Anyway, <laughs> lovely to see you.